Hope everybody is doing their best right now as we're going through this crazy time in our world. I'm Tony Bruschi, host of Real Ghost Stories Online. Wanted to invite you and let you know about our other brand new podcast that we just launched, Help Kill the Time for You. It's called The Dark Side of Wikipedia. It's about true crime and dark history. We dive into some of the strangest, most disturbed minds and experiences from our history and examine their story, their Wikipedia entry, and then discuss the cases, the individuals, and the psychology of the events as we go through each and every story. Some of our first episodes include Ed Gein, the BTK killer, the new London school explosion, Amityville murders, Richard Speck, Amelia Dyer, the General Slocum disaster, Jeffrey Dahmer, and more. New episodes every single week. Check out Dark Side of Wikipedia. Search it. Subscribe wherever you download podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and more. It's available now with new episodes every single week. Dark Side of Wikipedia. Search and subscribe today and stay safe out there. Today on Real Ghost Stories Online, a family moves into their new dream house only to find out that someone or something wants to call it home just as much as they do. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855 853 48 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown, and quite possibly, the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. And it is 855-853-4802 is our phone number here. Or write it in at realghoststoriesonline.com. That's right. That's how you get a story to us here at the uh, the program. It's uh, the weekend edition of Real Ghost Stories Online. Tony and Harper Bruski joining you for uh, our weekend kid friendly edition, where we make sure we uh, we don't uh, curse during the show. But the stories they're scary, so you know use your discretion depending on uh, how uh, how well your little ones handle ghost stories. Mine handles pretty much anything even better than some of the adults uh, around here. But uh, there you go. Uh, so, yes, if you like the show, support us, too. Please become an extra podcast person. We call that an EPP. EPP. You sign up for that at ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories. Five dollars a month gets you access to all the bonus material. It gets you uh, access to our ebook, our, our audio book. Uh, it also gets you access to uh, all of our uh, archived material, our advanced uh, uh, oper- our advanced uh, material, uh, all commercial free. So lots of ways to get all that stuff to help support the show and keep us on the air. We do greatly appreciate that. Uh, it, like I said, Tony and Harper joining you today. Uh, it is uh, 2020 uh, still, obviously, as we're uh, we're airing this. Who had zombie mink for 2020? <laughs> Anyone? I have no idea. Anyone have zombie mink? Uh, I got Jet- a purple squish ball here and I'm putting it in my sleeve and squishing it. It looks like a zombie mink bit my arm. It does. It looks like something out of The Walking Dead with your little purple squish ball over there that you're having stick out of your sleeve. Uh, we'll talk about the zombie mink in just a little bit. Uh, but uh, if you've heard about this, you're probably like, what? Really? Yes reported from many, many, many reputable news sources were zombie mink. Um, uh, I don't know what to tell you, but we'll go through that story shortly. And Merry Early Christmas as the Christmas season is approaching us. Uh, it is. Uh, this is airing uh, the first weekend in December. So uh, happy holidays. Merry Christmas to all. Uh, and uh, uh, here's to hoping we get through uh, the last month of this lovely year we will look back on as 2020 and never think of that same way. Again. I really felt that sarcasm. Did you really feel the sarcasm? <laughs> I felt the I'm sarcasm. glad you felt the sarcasm because it is <laughs> emanating off of me. Uh, <laughs> let's go to our first uh, story of the day. So as we moved into our newly built house in Clear Lake, Texas, a suburb of Houston near NASA in 1996, 
Everything was fine until our youngest daughter at the around the age of two or three started seeing people in her room at night. The first time her dad and I were asleep in our room, which was as a master suite downstairs, all the kids' rooms were upstairs. She came down and woke me up and asked for a drink of water and calmly announced, there's a man in my room. I kind of brushed it off because we had an alarm in that house and it had not gone off, so I was confident there was no one in the house. I got her a drink, took her back to bed, and over the next year, she would wake up and be upset and tell me that the man was in her room staring at her. She described him as having brown hair and carrying a pack, and he looked mean. One time she even said there were two of them. I was not sure what to do, but she clearly believed she was seeing these men in her room at night. I told her that they were confused and lost and that they could not hurt her. She could just tell them to go away. She said she hid under her covers until they left. Time went on. Summer, when she was about four and a half, she started to always request sleepovers in either her older sister or brother's room. She clearly did not want to sleep in her own room. Generally, generally one of her siblings would agree to let her sleep on the floor in their room. And one night after going through the whole uh, uh, not wanting to sleep in her room situation and her brother letting her sleep on the floor in that room and that for that night, I awoke and needed to get up and use the master be- and use the restroom. From our master bedroom, I could look out our door and see the stairway. After I used the bathroom, I'd gotten back into bed and looked toward the stairs as I laid back down. I always kept our door open as I wanted to be able to hear the kids at night if they needed me. I see what I thought at the time was our youngest daughter walking down the stairs. I loudly whispered, trying not to wake my husband for her to get back upstairs to bed. She looked to go back upstairs. I laid there for a few minutes and got to worrying that I probably had made her cry since I fussed at her and did not want her to wake up her brother. I got out of bed, went back upstairs to check on her. I turned the light on in the hall outside of our son's room to open the door and check on her. I kind of thought I did not remember hearing his door open or shut, but did not give it much thought. I look in, and both my youngest daughter and son are totally zonked out. That child had not just been walking down the stairway. Plus, when I saw who I thought was her on the steps, I thought she had on an oversized white T-shirt with a dog on it that she would sleep in, but she actually had on a little uh, cami and shorts. It was seriously sound asleep. I thought maybe it had been my oldest daughter and walked down the hallway to check on her. Same thing. She was sound asleep. My kids had never slept walk, so it could not be that. So who was on the stairs? Eventually, the youngest started to sleep in her room again, but one night... When she was about eight, our son called, for, uh, called me from his cell phone in the middle of the night. Kept my cell phone on my bed charging at night. I answered the phone thinking, what is he doing? And he said, Mom, you need to come up to my room. As she's up here, she's crying. So I hopped out of bed and hustled through the family room and up the stairs. She was in there and was upset. She told me she had gotten up to get a drink. And when she was looking over the railing down into the family room, she had seen a woman sitting on the couch. I just come through that room and saw no one, as well as the house alarm had not sounded, and we always set that alarm at night. Over the years, there were several times when I was home during the day by myself, just me and the dog. Several times I'd find myself going upstairs and looking around because I would hear loud noises upstairs. One time it sounded like someone had dropped a heavy binder onto a wood floor. And no appliances were running. They are all downstairs anyway, not upstairs. And the dog would be sleeping or lying in the room with me. Most times a dog would whip her head up and look, so I knew she heard the sounds coming from upstairs too. I finally started talking to whatever or whoever it was. I'd say, I hear you, but I don't know what you want. You need to go now. I know my husband thought I imagined it. Shared my bo- uh, I shared the, this with friends and they believe me. We had that house built, so I don't know what could have been the source of these happenings. By the time my husband and I were out one evening and our son was home alone, he had to be around 13. I guess our daughters were elsewhere with friends at night. We were not out too late. We arrived home by 10 p.m. or so and every light in the house was on. When we walked in, we saw he had gotten out every hunting knife and taekwondo weapon he owned. He promptly stated as we walked in the door, this house is haunted. I guess he heard the same noise as I would hear when I was home alone and it spooked him. There was one time myself that I heard a spirit whisper very loudly in my ear. I was in the hospital after surgery. I ended up having to stay an extra night. It was about 10-ish at night as I know I had the news on and I laid in the hospital bed. 
I had my own room and the bed was up against the wall. Someone whispered in my ear, Are you sleeping? Two times. I sat up in the bed and said, No, get out. I was not on pain medications that day or night. I had to stay because I was not putting on out enough urine. My husband was home with the three kids, so I did not want to call him and disturb him. I figured the nurses would think I was nuts, so I did not call them either. After I said to get out, I did not hear anything whispering again. The next day after I went home, I told my friend what happened. She had a friend who was a nurse at the hospital, and she told my friend that the floor I was on was known by staff to be haunted. I'll never forget the sound and feel of that whispering in my ear. Over the years, our youngest seems to, or seemed to grow out of seeing any spirits. On another note, our youngest daughter was a surprise pregnancy. We had a daughter and a son, and we're not planning on another child. I cannot imagine life without her now. I've been pulling baby clothes and blankets out and tagging them in preparation to have a garage sale when I found out I was pregnant again. About that time, I had a very vivid dream of my grandmother, who had passed in 1996. This was about March or April of 1997 when I had the dream. I'd never dreamed of my grandmother before, but in this dream, I saw her wearing all white, and she was in a beautiful gazebo. She was holding a baby. I remember the dream the next day when I woke up and was happy to have had a dream about her, but I kind of thought it was odd that she had a baby. I now passionately, passionately believe, and you will not convince me otherwise, that she was holding our youngest daughter and keeping her until it was time for her to join us here. I did not make the connection until after I realized I was pregnant. Our youngest had a great personality and sense of humor, and she reminds me a lot of my grandmother in that way. Well, that's pretty, that's pretty creepy if you have two men in your daughter's room and they look mean. Anybody would be concerned about that. Number one, you'd be concerned, is this a human that has broken in? But obviously their alarms never went off, so... A lot of the possibilities of someone getting through are not there. And then you narrow it down to, well, are these ghosts? And and what do they want? And why are they there? Yeah. And that ghost that whispered in her ear as she was in the hospital, like, are you sleeping? Mm -hmm. Are you sleeping? It makes me wonder, was that a ghost of the hospital? Was that a ghost that was from her home? that followed her to the hospital. All this seemed to start with them going into that house. I'd be curious to know more about the history of the land, what was on that uh, piece of property beforehand. Uh, did they bring anything into their home at the time? You know, sometimes when you move into a house, it's you do a bit of furniture shopping, like, oh, well, we need something for this space or that space. And depending on where you get your furniture, you know, it, did you go antique shopping for that furniture? Is this furniture straight from the furniture store? There's just so many things that uh, that could play a role in what brought this in to their home. And those are things I would suggest analyzing and taking a look at if they want to try and figure out why suddenly these, these occurrences began at that point in their lives. Yeah, and it's... Very creepy because they said that they specifically had that house built mm -hmm. on that plot of land. So it's not like the house is old or anything. No, it, it's not old. And that's where it, it gets to be kind of a mystery of how and why did these things happen there. Thank you for sharing that story with us. Our phone number is 855-853-4802. Here at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost stories with us. Dear Tony and Jenny and Harper and Carol, my mink are coming back from the dead. Love a listener in Denmark. No, that's not a real letter, but this is a real news story. I, it's all over the place. This is not from some weird, obscure website or anything like that. Denmark wants to dig up zombie mink, quote unquote, from mass graves. After human infections with coronavirus strain, 17 million animals were culled, buried. Then hundreds were pushed out of the ground by decomposition gas is what they are saying. Here's the story in Copenhagen. Denmark's government wants to dig up mink that were culled to prevent the spread of the coronavirus after some resurfaced from mass graves. 
Denmark ordered all farmed mink to be culled earlier this month after finding that 12 people had been infected by a a mutated strain of the virus that causes COVID-19, which passed from humans to mink and then back to humans again. The decision led to 17 million animals being destroyed and to the resignation last week of Food and Agriculture Minister Morgans Jensen after it was determined that the order was illegal. Dead mink were tipped into trenches at a military area in western Denmark and covered with two meters. That's about six feet of soil, okay? And this is an important part here. Just trying to think, well, how deep were they buried that they were coming up and the gases were pulling them back up to the surface? Six feet is about as tall as that door right there behind you that's leaning up against the wall. So top to bottom, that's how deep down those mink were. If you you put that into a hole and dug a hole, like let's say the top of that door is the ground, the bottom is the bottom of that hole. That's where the mink were put into. Well? And let me finish the story. So hundreds of these mink began resurfacing. The explanation? Pushed out of the ground by what authorities say is gas from their decomposition. Newspapers have referred to them as zombie mink. Jensen's replacement, Rasmus Perrin, said Friday that he supported the idea of digging up the animals and incinerating them. He said he asked the Environmental Protection Agency to look into whether it could be done. Parliament was to be briefed on the issue on Monday. The macabre burial sites guarded 24 hours a day to keep people and animals away have drawn complaints from residents about possible health risks. Authorities say there's no risk of the graves spreading the coronavirus, but locals worry about the potential contamination of drinking water and a lake less than 200 meters away. I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist at all on anything. Uh, there, there's some things that are, you know that are just, you know, facts. They're not conspiracies, but they're reality and they're not what people are telling us. But uh, the idea that gases just simply push these things six feet to the surface, either one of two things is happening here. A, they did not get dug down that deep or there were so many that they were pretty close to the surface and it wasn't six feet of soil between the two and that part is off. Or there's something else happening here, and these animals are reanimating after they're dead. Because it's, because it's gas. Like, if you dug that lamp, well, if you dug those pictures six feet down, and then all of a sudden this gas starts coming up, do you think that that would... um? Well, the gas comes from within the bodies of the, the decomposing animals. So it wouldn't be a picture that would be buried. It'd have to be something living uh, or that was once living. And they're saying that the gas in that is pushing them through six feet of soil. And that's soil. Soil is filled with rocks and... Well, why is this the first time we're, we're seeing anything rising from a grave? That, yeah. that I mean, there's there's been mass graves of animals forever there's been mass graves of people uh, too in in very sad situations but I, I i do not recall there ever being a chapter in any history book stating oh and yeah the gases uh that's what made them rise from the dead now there have not been reports of the mink coming up and walking around and and such but they're like suddenly at the surface at least that's what they're telling us. Um, why they, and if that's all it is, if it's just gases and they're just rising to the top, why the need to dig all of them up and burn them? I mean, we all know you shoot zombies in the head, but, but it, I don't know. There just seems to be a little more to the story than is being told. I mean, it is ripe for spooky, weird story, but I don't know. I mean, it, it, it just seems like, I don't know. I mean, it's 2020 at this point. I guess zombie mink were not uh, necessarily on anyone's radar, but uh, hey, it's kind of like, like the game just combined two random words and it may happen this year. Zombie, zombie mink. mink. Yeah. So. Zombie mink. There you go. 
Zombie Mink for 2020. November of 2020. One more month left, kids. Let's see what can happen. Uh, Probably eight... not much. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you have to say that? <laughs> because it's reality. Knock on wood. Hope to God, not much. Um, <laughs> 855-853-4802. Our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost stories with us. Uh, let's go uh, over to another caller and uh, a letter rather and uh, hear this ghost story. One day at school a couple of years ago, my friend and I decided that we wanted to stay after school and play a game of basketball in the gymnasium. We knew it would become boring very quickly with only two people, so we invited several other guys to join us. They were all going to out to eat after school, but they said that they would come back to the gym afterward. School ended at three, and my friend, my girlfriend, and I went into the gym to shoot around and simply hang out until the other guys showed up. As it turned out, the others never arrived. Although we were angry, we still had an enjoyable time amongst the three of us. At about five, we decided to head home. My friend had already gone as my girlfriend, and I was walking down the steps of the school towards my car. Everything seemed to be normal at the time, and we were laughing and joking around with each other. We both entered my car, and I asked her if she wanted to go to her house, my house, or just to go do something else. She requested to go to her house. From that point on, I was not exactly there anymore. Now, some of this is what she told me happened, partially what I remember. After entering my car, I started to drive out of the school parking lot down a hill and into the small town in which our school was located. The town she lived in is roughly 15 miles from where the school is. I did not recall anything until we were about halfway to our destination. My girlfriend said that she was talking to me and asking questions, but I was not responding. She also said that I did not seem to be breathing. That I was clenching the steering wheel very tightly. Another thing that I apparently did was viciously pound the dashboard with my hand because there was a large damaged area on it afterwards and my hand was bruised on the side. At this point, I can vaguely remember someone yelling my name, but it seemed to be very distant and far away. This went on until we reached the town in between her town and the school's location. The town we were now in had an elementary school that sits atop a hill adjacent to the town church. I then drove my car into the playground area of the school, made a large circular turn, and parked the car facing the exit of the playground. At this instant, I finally started to come to, as the faint screams and cries became louder and louder. I woke from my haze to hear my girlfriend screaming my name. And I, who did not have the slightest notion of what had happened, answered, What? Now she started to scream even louder at me because I believed that she thought I was just messing with her the whole time. But in fact, I was totally clueless about what had occurred. Anyway, I began asking her questions about what had happened and why she was so flustered. She was so shaken up and still crying as she told me all of these horrifying things. Cue the, cue the weird voices inside my head. At least I thought they were weird in my head. As she was still explaining, I looked out my windshield to see the giant walnut tree that stands in front of the playground. Only on this day, a black hooded figure stood on top of the highest branch. It had a long black cloak with a hood and it was posing exactly the way that Jesus is portrayed on the cross with his head limp on the side looking towards the ground. The voices started to get louder in my head, several voices still talking simultaneously at the same time, none of which were English. The voices were becoming unbearable as I stared in disbelief at the black hooded figure in the tree. Still staring, I leaned over to my girlfriend, pointed at the figure and asked, do you see that? Of course she did not. By this point, she probably thought I was crazy. Suddenly, all the voices stopped. The hooded figure raised its head, revealing glowing red eyes staring right at me. In shock and completely terrified, I stared on. Then, only one voice did I hear in my head, and it came from the figure. Six words, enough, though not in English, were spoken by the figure, followed by an eerie silence. And then, though the figure had no visible mouth, he began laughing, a horrible, wretched laugh. At that moment, I broke free of the trance and turned the car on. I slammed the gears into drive and sped off as fast as I could towards my girlfriend's house. That was the last time I ever encountered something otherworldly. To this day, my girlfriend and I do not speak of this and have not spoken of it since that day. Hopefully, you guys can make some sense of this because I think about it almost every day and still cannot come up with anything concrete about what happened. 
My theory is that in my car driving, I have been possessed, and the demon did not show itself until we reached the elementary school. If anyone has any other ideas, I'd love to hear them. A demon at a elementary school. Well, a demon in the the car, too, that, you know, where they seem to have taken over someone. I It wasn't made clear in the story if, if this individual... I think this person was driving while this was happening, if if I'm understanding correctly, which that in itself is an insanely scary proposition. If you're completely out of it or in a different world, being able to continue driving and not crashing the car is kind of amazing. But sometimes, you know, you, you can drive and I know you don't have any experience in this, but sometimes you can daydream and drive at the same time and still be super focused on the road. Um, not something I advise trying to do on purpose, but it, it can be done. Um, but the this was far more than a daydream. I mean, something that seemed to take over that much. I mean, th- there's really one of two things going on here. There was either some sort of a, if we're talking strictly in mental health terms, some sort of a psychotic break that really pulled this person out of reality in many, many factors, in many ways, but still kept them there enough to be able to drive the vehicle and then they something reconnected. Uh, or there was something paranormal going on. I mean, I, I'd love to know more about what surrounds this story in terms of events before, events after, anything that could give us some more clues as to um, you know, what, what life is like at that moment in time of this story Uh, taking place because it's hard to say exactly what was going on there it could be possession of some sort yeah or a trance yeah i mean that's that's the thing it's if something you know attached itself and kind of was coming through uh, at that moment either way horrifying and uh, extremely dangerous no matter any way you look at it I'm, i'm 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 and i'm also kind of amazed uh that at the end they said you know, me and my girlfriend still don't, we just don't talk about it. I'm amazed the the part of the sentence of that the girlfriend is still there <laughs> <laughs> is, is part of it. Um, you know, that's someone who, you know, knows you and, and sees the real good in you and wasn't completely horrified by the situation and fled because, you know, in, in all reality, you can't blame somebody if they were to do that after going through a situation like that, that would be traumatizing uh, to to live through that. Uh, thank you for sharing that experience with us. 855-853-4802 is our phone number. Let's go to a caller. Hi, you are on the air. Hey, guys. I was listening to a, a show you did um, about astral projection. You guys have been kind of going back and forth on that, and I've heard it in a few other episodes you've done. Um, I do want to let you know, based on my experience and experience of others that I've met, it is very, very, very much possible and not easy per se to do, but um, it's not hard either. Um, I've had experiences. I've done it. I've had friends that have had experiences. Um, there's one that can do it at will. Um, I mean, it's very, it's easy to understand how to do it. Um, the other thing is actually doing it. But I do believe in astral projection. My thought process as you were talking about haunting your parents' neighbor, um, Tony, I feel astral projection comes into play when uh, you have a connection with that person or with a a son or a grandma that lives, you know, a ways away and you want to see her. You guys have done stories like that in the past as well. I believe it's all based on connection. That's that's how I feel about astral projection. If you're not, you know, your heart's not connected, um, it is very, very much harder to be able to do that. Um, and then I also had another question, if you guys wanted to answer this. Um, I have a good friend of mine, and we've known each other for a number of years, and we, we seem to have a connection. We're not related. We're not um, any of that. We seem to have a connection that... Uh, is very, very odd to me. I'll just tell you this quick bit, and you guys tell me what you think. Um, there's nights and days and whatever that um, I'll be thinking of 
you know, thinking about this person and, uh, you know, hey, I wonder how she's doing or, you know, whatever the case. And there's other days that, man, I hope she's okay. Like, I'm, I'm worried about her and I have no reason to be um, at that moment. And the next day she'll call me, say, hey, uh, I, felt, I felt the need to call you. You know, yesterday this and this and this happened. And I went, holy crap. And that's why I felt, you know, very uh, terrible feeling for her or about her. Um, and this has happened 20 times probably in the last five years. And it's it's just weird how this connection we have. I mean, what, what are your guys' thoughts on that? Um, love the show. I just started listening. It's been about a week or so. I'm a security guard, graveyards. So it's really very fun to listen to what you guys have and what you bring um, to the show. Good luck, guys. Um, look forward to hearing in the future. Thanks. Bye. I'm all about setting the mood for whatever you're doing, but uh, I don't know that I would be able to do the security guard thing all by myself all night long listening to ghost stories. What about me being there right behind like one of the biggest graves and then <laughs> me jumping out as soon as you get to that grave to check it? What would you do? Well, he's not a security guard at a graveyard. Graveyard shift just means working late at night. Um, but even if he's in a office or a factory or something, uh, something big that's being guarded, there's lots of places to hide and do that sort of thing. It would be horrifying. I'd probably have a heart attack. I mean, I think that's why I wouldn't be able to listen to the ghost stories as much as I would like to. I think I, the living would end up killing me because of something would jump out like a cat or something or a homeless person or something would be startling out of nowhere and in my mind i've just heard all these ghost stories but uh more power to you if i guess uh if you can get through that um thoughts on the uh the story and uh his ideas on the astral projection and and there being the link with the family for a family or or just personal connection for that to be where that happens astral projection almost feels like like something you would say Look out for the astro projection. <laughs> <laughs> like some sort of like laser ray. Yeah. Now, astral projection. Um, I don't, you probably haven't been on some of the episodes where we've talked about that. I've been on one of them. Okay. So you know what we're talking about? We're like, essentially someone is seeing someone in a different place. who's really not there. Um, I, I can see that or, or, or knowing something about someone um, when they're really not there. That's not the astral projection, but that, that empathetic feeling that, you know, you feel or you're concerned with. It happens a lot with, with parents and kids. Sometimes you just know, even if you're not with your kid, there's something wrong and they need you. Even if you can't hear them yelling or screaming or whatnot, but there's trouble. Um, that's a very, very common thing. It's also common with, with siblings as well and twins, but it can also happen in just very strong emotionally connected relationships. So uh, I, I don't doubt that at all. I think that we feel the strongest connections there. Uh, although I do think some people just have such a strong connection to humanity that they end up picking up all these feelings and all these emotions from almost anyone who happens to be um, around or in their presence or maybe projecting in their presence. But uh, for the, the, I guess the, the more common would be something where there is that strong emotional connection between the two living people. Scary story. Thank you for sharing. And I'm glad you're enjoying the show as you're working the graveyard shift. That's going to wrap up today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. If you like the show, please help us stay on the air, become an extra podcast person. EPP, as we call them, you sign up at ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories. Get all the bonus episodes, brand new ones every week, our ebook, our audiobook, and so much more. Get one month free if you sign up for an annual membership, ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories. Until next time, for Harper and all of us at Real Ghost Stories Online, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening. <laughs>